how uh, the congressman's uh, views of President Nixon shaped the way in which he handled this? No, I don't think so. I think. I think clearly he's a Democrat, and clearly he would vote for a Democratic presidential candidate. But when this obligation was thrust upon him, his, his view was the institution of the presidency. And being who he was, he had just extraordinary respect and awe for the presidency. That This was the center of everything that he believed in as, as a patriot. And so Nixon, in a sense, was just a holder of that institution. But he felt what he was being asked to do, and what his committee was at, what the House was being asked to do, what, the, what, what Congress was being asked to do, is, is to view a holder of this institution. But he felt that the institution, above all, had to be protected. And so he didn't have any, he didn't have the visceral feelings about Nixon. I think, as I said earlier, I think it was some disappointment when he heard the tapes. But those are personal disappointments about, you know, his language and that. But, but that's, and he thought it wasn't very presidential. But he didn't have that partisan um, anger that was so prevalent amongst many sort of anti-war or, 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 or very liberal members of the Democratic Party. He didn't, he never, he never voiced that kind of view. This is before or after. What he voiced was great disappointment that, that, that he felt that this individual would abuse the office. But that was, it, it was more of a disappointment in President Nixon than anything else. How important was the fact that he was an immigrant? Extremely important. It, it, I think it formed his whole view that, that here was an opportunity as a young man to come, be an immigrant, come to this country. And it's all the cliches. He, he embodied all the cliches of to grow up to be, you could be anything. And he worked really hard at this. You know, as a young man, the, the stories are that he, he would take, he would go out and practice speech making. He would, put, he would put marbles in his mouth, as I think probably somebody, the Greeks or Aristophanes or someone did. But, but to be able to enunciate, uh, he wanted to be American. He, he, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be an American. He wanted to sound, talk, and be an American, and be a patriot. You know, always wore, long before this, it meant anything, always wore a little flag in his lapel. And it wasn't like a, a signal where you were liberal or conservative. He was a patriot. And uh, so I think that was, again, became very important historically. Accident of history. But, you know, here he was, all his life groomed. He was groomed for this, uh, for this task. Tell us about the decision to put cameras in the hearing. Well, he always said to me that I wound up having to deal with all that. I never met a press person in my life until I got to the office. Uh, never. I mean, I had no contact with press people. And every day, out in front of the office would be 25 or 30 press people, every day. And you know, following the case, they'd follow Rodino, they'd follow Dora, they just, you know, everybody else. It was just, it was constant sort of. But I must say, just the, the quality of the press corps was extraordinary at this time. I mean, extraordinary human beings in their own right. Um, some of the great reporters of our time covered this story. And, um, uh, and he always said to me, and that sort of was left to me, that all the press contacts, press conversation, once in a while you would get a conversation with the chairman and John Doerr, for say. And then all the press would make fun of it because they got no information. It was a very, but we'd do it. Every once in a while we'd have a little press gathering, kind of, but they just, it was, but so I was the, and it was important because the congressman said, he kept saying to me, remember, he said, you have to explain to the public what we're doing. And that's how you explain it. You don't give leaks or anything like that. So on a regular basis, we had, to, we had to let the public know what's going on, what the process is. Very important, the process, why, why this is being done. And so as this was going on, I just sort of thought in my mind, like, well, this is going to be televised, obviously. I mean, when the hearings actually take place, the American public has to view it. 
and it was very interesting. It was very formed by, by the Watergate hearings. As you remember, it was very, you know, the hearings, it was very chaotic, and cameras and all that kind of stuff. So I had this vision. Eventually, by the way, I went to the movie business, so I got, sort of got this visual uh, idea that I wanted the public, and I talked to the Congressman about a lot about this too, that when, when we as citizens came in to view this, I wanted them to feel an intimacy that they and their member were, were in a conversation, in a sense, in, 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 in that they were talking to them. So I wanted everything that remotely looked like a television or a, or a cable, I wanted it gone. I had this very clean view. So you, can you imagine doing this today? So I went to the networks. And the mayor came up to New York, and I met with all the network presidents, and I said, this is my vision. This is some kid from Ohio. I had a vision, so I had a vision. I said, this is my vision. I want, I want, a, I want this. So I want any cameras. I said, well, I said, I want no cameras. So, so they proceeded, and of course I was taking the task for this because I had not asked for the speaker's approval. And the committee room was on the first floor. So I had them build they, behind the committee, because I would not allow cameras. I did not want any cameras behind the members where you, could, you and I could see it. So they had to build a room outside the building where they would place the cameras and all the equipment. And then they would have little, and then there was curtains behind the, uh, the members. And then they would have little holes. And then there'd be no none of these wires, and then in the back of the room there would be a stand built, which then you'd get the, the view of the committee. And they bought all this at their own expense. They said, absolutely. And so if you look at it, if you look at the hearings on television, I doubt if you'll see any cameras, um, television cameras. Um, but that was sort of the idea. But that's sort of the mechanics of sort of how that was done. The important thing is to televise. I think there was a lot of, once this had already been cast, I know John was very nervous about this decision um, and that it just made him very nervous that he thought this was going to be televised. Uh, that I remember. Congressman was less, I mean, this is, this is his world, this is what we had dealt with, what else are you going to do, this is the age we live in. But, then the decision was made that you know, we would televise, and of course, the rest is the rest. But um, there was some discussion around that, but it was all after it was all done. Francis, I've got to ask you this. <laughs> You've told, told us about the role that the congressman plays as a chairman. In, did the chairman want it to be televised? I can't recall. <laughs> Frank, Francis, you're smiling. <laughs> he was. He wanted the public to understand, but he came from an era before television. And so I guess if, his, if he had his sort of wishes, I suppose he may, he may have chosen something else. But Francis, are you telling us that you went to New York and met with network executives without already having permission to even televise these things? There's a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure. <laughs> no decisions were made. I, I did go to New York. I, I did meet with all the executives. I did meet with, you know, the, uh, uh, the correspondents and all the kind of thing and had this guy, yes. I did. But it was, a fa it was a fact gathering. It's a pretty gutsy thing to do. Again, yeah. But this came out of a relationship, I think, with the congressman. In other words, my role as a staffer never, ever would I have done anything that was not, I think, with, without his approval in the sense of understanding what, what his core was. And though I think, because he constantly said to me, this is a public, this must be uh, approved by the country, by the citizens of the country, I just don't think he ever carried it to that. In other words, I felt very strong that I was carrying out his wishes. I just don't think he understood the technology, how to do that. And so I just closed that gap. Was this an O'Brien brothers idea? 
No, that was I can't blame my brother for this. This was this was this was my idea. I can't believe that the networks did this, but you know. Well, what I want to because again, you know, when you, when you describe the door selection process, when you describe the when you describe the door selection process, it's a little improvised. There's something very professional about this vision for the for the room. Where did you where you get it? Where'd you get it? I mean, was this something you'd want? You, had you been interested in production before? I mean, no, nothing. I think you know. I think back. I get, um, and now you reach a certain age. I think some things you're just good at, and some things you're not. And I think I was lucky enough to be. You know, I was born with certain. I don't, I don't know how you wind up with certain skills, and um, you know, not intellectual skills, but I, I, have good, I have good people skills. I have good, not that I'm a good communicator, but I have good, I have good people skills, even at that age. And I just think, and I think I had a great mentor in, in the congressman. I just, I've learned so much that I've carried the rest of my life. But um, I don't know why. In other words, I look back and I, I don't know, I don't think I'd made the same decisions today. I don't think I would have done the things, and maybe it's it's youth. Um, and so looking back, you say, "Wow, that was a good decision." But I don't know how. In other words, I don't know to answer your question. I don't know how those how it winds up that way. How you're good at things or not good or or that. I wasn't interested in production or anything. I just knew what bothered me about the Watergate hearings was all these cameras, and I just felt it was it was circusy for me. That was all. And so it was a, I thought it was a common sense. And again, this is not my hearing. It sort of fit his demeanor. In other words, I had to always put myself in his, and I think I'm pretty good at that. I can, I'm very good at putting myself in other people's place. And I think that's who I represented. And I thought, that's where he is. In other words, it, it, it reflected him, it reflected the institution. Again, his great respect for the institution, that that's how, and why would he know how to do that? I didn't even know how to do it, but... Now, you brought up this issue of televising uh, the proceedings when I asked you about the congressman showing emotion. That, I mean, that's how you brought it up. So, uh, yeah. I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was my, my point is, that it was, did he show emotion when... <laughs> yeah, they were pretty upset. He and John were very upset with me when I told them. They were really, I got yelled at. But you take to the woodshed. John took me to the woodshed, if you can imagine, and the congressman took me to the woodshed. For talking to the executives? For making this decision. It's already done. Wait a second. I thought it was a fact finding mission. It, it was already, it was being built. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I shouldn't respect. They were, they were building. I got yelled, I got yelled at. There's no doubt about it. I got yelled at, okay? I got really yelled at. What, what are the, what are the, what do the committee members think? I don't know. We never asked them. But they didn't know they were going to be on TV. I have no. I can't remember. I just. We have to tell the audience they won't know this because this is a C-SPAN world. Right. Congress wasn't television. Never. There was nothing on television. Never. Well, Watergate was yes. on. The Watergate hearings were on, right? And and again, all the congressman kept saying to me all year, and he said to everybody, it wasn't like he said to me, was this decision, whatever it may be, had to be approved by the American citizens. I'm thinking, how else would you do this? I mean, they had a, there had to be a sense of openness. There had to be a sense. I mean, he had me going out every day and meeting with all these press people, you know, and keeping them informed without talking about the proceedings. I, you know, there, so had to be, there had to be some extraordinary trust that I had to build up with this generation of reporters, number one. Because clearly things were said that never got, you had to give people context. So, and there were important institutional papers, the New York Times, or all these papers that set the tone. So you had to deal with them and you had to give them context. They constantly, so there were great reporters like Jim Norton, you know, uh, Bill Kovic, uh, there were whole, actually it's interesting, the Post was not one of the major, they were the major paper on the Watergate. But they sort of missed, they didn't quite understand the, this wasn't an investigation. In other words, they, they sort of missed reporting on the 
on impeachment because it wasn't an investigative. So it wasn't a Bob Woodward, Bernstein kind of an investigation. You weren't uncovering facts. It was a process. So your, the reporters and the organizations that stepped forward were, were people who understood process much better. Excuse but again, you know, you had, again, Congress, we kept saying, you, ha you can't leave people in the dark. You have to, in proper time, keep people informed. You had to keep the members informed. In other words, you had to move everybody along at the same time. And you know, so my job wound up sort of dealing with that outside world, and his job was to deal with the inside world. Did you deal with Woodward or Bernstein? No, very rarely. Two or three times. Never came, you know, Bob Woodward came and told me, you know, whispered those things in my ear, and I said, I have no idea what he's talking about, and so he went away. Uh, by the way, was Elizabeth Drew one of the people that you asked uh, for recommendations for? Uh, Not remember. But, okay. It, it could have it been. She's still a very close friend. Uh, Mary McGroy. I might have asked Mary. I, you know, she was you're a great reporter in her time. Uh, Daniel Shore. Now, too, now he was too. Uh, he's too investigative reporter. For me. I, 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 I grew to like Dan Shore a lot, but he was. Um, now there's a whole group of Jack Nelson, who was a great civil rights reporter. It, it wound up there was a generation of reporters, and that's where John Doerr became so important. There was a whole generation of report Bill Covage, uh, uh, Jack Nelson, and others who, who went south in, the, in, in those early 60s and covered the civil rights movement, who then became bureau chiefs and senior reporters. And those are the people you just, there was a, you have a great rapport with them. Um, but the point is, it's not, that's irrelevant. What's irrelevant is, is you had to keep the public informed uh, as you moved along. I'm gonna to move to some things that might not have been O'Brien decisions. Thank God. Uh, uh, the decision not to investigate to actually base the whole proceeding on the work done by the White House, the Watergate Special Prosecution Force, the Senate Watergate Committee. I don't know how, I remember that uh, that was a decision made, yeah. but that was a decision made. I mean, I was sitting there, but sort of, that was way above me kind of thing. I didn't understand it, but that was a decision made within the committee, within with the leadership of the House, and with the staff, and with the, I mean, that's, that's, they came to that conclusion, but I don't, I think they thought they had everything. Uh, first, I don't think we had the manpower. I don't think we had the, the wherewithal to do original investigation, I believe. But that's. But you could have hired more people. Could have. I just don't remember now. Okay. Uh, you'd have to ask others who were in a better position than I was. The decision to issue a subpoena, at least one. That must have been hard. There very were some hard. people that did not want. Very hard. It was a very, I remember, again, that I would be an observer in a situation like that. You know, when those discussions mm -hmm. took place, extremely intense. Um, I think some of the members and the lawyers that you will interview, or have interviewed, will talk about that. Uh, just very intense. Again, not arguing, but just, you don't know what to do. I mean, this is, you know, these were, and that's how Rodino treated everything. Everything was momentous. I mean, again, you had to respect the presidency. You had to respect the institution. And you had to respect the person who held that job, was President Nixon. So everything was dealt with in that context. He set the tone. So you just don't willy-nilly just you know, send a letter to the president or, or subpoenas or whatever. You just, you, you just don't do that without a lot of thought, a lot of forethought. Do you think he was reluctant? Sure, he was reluctant. He was very reluctant. He was reluctant. I mean, yes, he was reluctant to do it because it was, it was precedent setting. It was, it was a larger decision. He was very reluctant. Do you think that Mr. Doar had to convince him? Yes. I think he, John, had to present the case. He had to, as a good lawyer will, he had, he had to present why this was critical. Yes, absolutely. Do you remember? The decision to retranscribe some of the tapes because the transcripts weren't very good, or that it was felt they weren't good. Yeah, I remember that, but I just I remember it, ha it happened. Um, tell us, uh, since you did not know how the process would go, tell us about the effect of uh, the Supreme Court decision, the unanimous decision against the president. 
I think it was a jolt to the committee. This is more of a member issue. In other words, I think that was that was like a, a wow moment. Wow, W O W wow. I mean it just and I think it had a powerful impact on the Republicans. Um, that's why I remember just it was Do do you remember uh, ever playing the smoking gun tape? No. To the do you remember the effect of the transcript of the smoking gun? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the effect on the on the chairman? Nothing. There was I mean, he absorbed it. I remember we talked about it one evening. And it just, you know, it was rather a matter of fact conversation, I remember that kind of thing. I was like sort of flabbergasted. I can remember myself, I'm sitting there thinking, man, wow, because I just they just were reporting this. And it was all I can remember my vague memory that it was all very matter of fact. And there was John and I think a couple of the lawyers, they were just it was a matter of fact conversation. That's all I remember. But in my mind I'm thinking, wow, this is this is really important. You didn't know, nobody knew the president was going to resign. No. So you had to think about presenting to the House. We, what was the next step supposed to be for you? Actually, I had already started. I went over and met with Mr. Mansfield. Or, you know, sort of, what does this mean? You know, what's the pro it just He sent me off just to meet with. You mean to talk about the Senate? Yeah, to talk about the Senate. I went over there a couple of times. Um, I think there there was preparation. I mean, I, I, I know there was preparation. I was not involved in those conversations. Um, for some reason, he wanted me to go start talking to the Senate. That I remember before his staff did, or the committee. And I remember I had a couple of conversations with, with Mr. Mansfield's staff. Um, Can you recall any? Just, just procedural, you know. What's the pro again? What's the process? He, I mean, it, I was sent out as a rather a fact finding. You know, what's how are you going to go about this? You know, if this comes here, what does it mean? That kind of thing. And just, and I think he just he didn't want any sort of connection from the staff because he didn't want to give the impression that all of a sudden you know there's a done deal and you know we're over in the Senate. So he wanted some very informal conversation because he I think he was just looking for knowledge. What's this is before the votes. Yeah. Was there a timetable? When when would the House? When was the House supposed to vote? Again, it never happened because the president resigned. Sometime that fall. So it was going. To, there were going to be a few months because, of course, your votes were at the end of July. So you were going to go into an August recess. Come out in the fall. Oh my goodness! This would have been a drawn out process. So well, well we didn't know. In other words. We just assumed that. Again, nobody had been through this before, so we don't know what the House would have done. In other words, if it, once it left our hands, see, it's just like that. It leaves your hands. In other words, this goes to the full House then, and other people start taking control. You know, the speaker play, you know, I mean, this is now that, that timetable is no longer the chairman's timetable. So we just had to start making assumptions and preparing. But what conversation did play, and there was a lot of conversations, by the way, with the Speaker and with Mr. O'Neill about, I mean, they had to start preparing for this if this was going to happen. Um, but I sort of remember we thought, I guess there would have been an August break. I mean, we just, we just didn't know. But, you know, so we thought it would be pretty soon after the vote. But I, we always thought, you know, September. And then it would go to the Senate. By the end of the year, we are, if, what conversations we had, he always thought this would be done by that year. I mean, the trial would occur in the Senate by the Correct. end of the year, if in fact, if in fact, it, 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 you know, the steps move forward, he was found, charged, you know, and then tried. That the process he thought would be over, he guessed. We were just that was just random conversations. No one knew. Did anyone know if the in, in the the inquiry that your staff would play a role or the don't know I don't I don't remember those conversations uh, I don't 
you'd have to ask the staff. Did uh, did the congressman edit the statements of information? Did he actually go through and make suggestions to? Mm -hmm. I mean on the charges? I mean on the. Uh, yeah, on the well, first of all, I meant just the 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 material mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. of, of did he edit the articles of impeachment? Mm -hmm. He did, and he can't because I don't know. But I remember, yes, they 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 bring over and they talk, and he would he would talk about this and this wording, that wording, the, what this mean, and that kind of. Yep, there was there was editing, and other members too. I mean, it was not. Did he did he did he did he want to get rid of a few of these articles? Did he thought that they wouldn't? wouldn't yeah, he he thought some were, again. He put it through the political prism of the of the process, and I thought he, f and I can't remember what, I mean, he was stronger about some than others. Um, I'm referring to the one about the secret bombing of Cambodia, which was yeah. the fourth article, and the fifth was yeah, he's, he, taxes. He, see, he thought that was too political. The, the, the Cambodia one? Yeah. What about the taxes and the president's I don't remember. I remember the Cambodia thing came up, we thought we played right into a partisan kind of anti-war, doesn't matter what we were or the members of the committee, just, he just thought that was outside. He wasn't comfortable with it. But he couldn't prevent it? No. He couldn't. But you asked me what he thought. No, no. <laughs> so this was, do you think it was something he did to appease the more liberal? Yeah. You had to. In other words, put it to a vote. I mean, he, he, his judgment would be not to do it. But that's, that wasn't his call. Um, part of the pressure on him and you mentioned this to me off camera, but you know, we're going to talk about it. Was that you said that the White House tried to mob him up? What do you mean? Right. Italian American from Newark, New Jersey. Um, you know, it's it's the cliche that you know Italians are are mob connected political people. There was a lot of corruption out of Newark. His roommate. I think it was Congressman Antonizio, was a congressman, eventually became mayor, went to prison. There were a lot of politicians out of the wards of Newark and surrounding area who went to prison and found have connection organized crime. So the White House immediately upon, once the process began, started putting stories out that he was, he was influenced or in some way connected to the families, the crime families of New Jersey. And this was, we had to answer this on a regular basis. We had to deal with this issue almost every day in the early days. And papers put major investigations on this. And I do believe it was finally the Wall Street Journal came forward with a story just ending this. There actually was a tape that they, there was a series of tapes. There was a tape they uncovered, it must have been an FBI tape or some tape that they uncovered, that where he is brought up in the tape. And the clear, and I don't remember the exact word, but the clear implication from the tape is that he's not one of us. And that was it. And there was a story in the Wall Street Journal and others, and that, but very, very intense from sort of summer, starting with back to President, uh, Vice President Agnew, right through the fall into the winter, we had to deal with these constant stories of, of his, his purported connections to organized crime. How did you become convinced that the White House was behind some of them? I don't know who else would be. I mean, <laughs> it's sort of logic. I mean, who else? I mean, where would these stories? And reporters would come to you. And say this is we just heard this, you know, et cetera. And they just, you know, we knew where it was coming from. It just there's nothing you could do about it. You just had to stand up, you had to say, here, 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 this is who he is. This is his record. You know, these are his finances. This is, you know, you just had to you had to put your palms up, as we say, and say, you know. One of the other decisions that the chairman had to make was whether to uh, call witnesses to be interrogated or interviewed. Nine people were interviewed. Mm -hmm. Chuck Colson. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how that came about and what role 
chairman play besides making the call? Well, he made the call to do it. I think it was, it was a strong staff, I think, uh, feeling that they had to call these people. I never partook in any of those because that was a committee issue. I wasn't permitted to be in. There's no reason for me to be in those hands. So I don't remember any of the, uh, uh, the meetings themselves. Where were you when you found out that President Nixon was going to resign? <clears throat> we were sitting in our office uh, in, in the Rayburn building, me and the congressman. We had the old TV set right there. And we got a call. Could have been from St. Clair. We got a call from someone that the president was going to go on television. I'm trying to remember now, 9 o'clock, I forget, and resign. We were just in utter shock. I just remember sitting there uh, that night, just, we didn't know what to say. Nobody said anything. We were just, it was just shock. It never entered our minds, ever. At least none of the people I... So you thought he would, the president would fight right through the trial? Why wouldn't he? He didn't show any signs. I mean, they just, it just, it was nothing. It was just, it just, it sort of took our breath away.